criticism. I was a paid uh, advocate for everything you oppose, and I was pretty good at it. I was on in the Wall Street Journal, I was on Fox News, I was in the National Review, I was on talk radio programs, and I would come to events like this and push back against climate action. But in the course of 23 years, my mind slowly changed. There was not any one eureka moment, uh, but it was an aggregation of things which moved me from my old position to my new position. And just for a few minutes, let me tell you a little bit about what that was like. The very first thing I found out was 15 years or so ago, uh, this event occurred. 15, I was on a TV show. I was debating climate change with uh, a fellow named Joe Rahm. He's a climate scientist now at the uh, Center for uh, American Progress. Uh, back then, however, there was no cap. He was an official uh, in, the, in the Clinton administration and a you know, policy advocate. And I was on TV debating about climate. And I said, look, you know, the, you know, back in the late 1980s, Dr. James Hansen testifies in front of the United States Senate and says the warming is upon us. It's not just a theory. It's a fact. And if we don't do something about it soon, we are going to cook the planet. And then he offered projections about future emissions uh, and temperature increases if we don't do anything. And I said on TV, well, that's all well and good. I'm not complaining about the uh, observation that global warming is happening, the industrial emissions have to do about it, do with it. But we've had more than a decade since Hansen's testimony. We have temperature data we can look at. And if we do that, we find that James Hansen predicted about three or four times more warming than we've actually seen. Now, that doesn't mean he's a quack, but it does mean the models are running high, and the climate doesn't appear to be a sense of the greenhouse gas emissions as we thought. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm pushing back against panic or the idea that there's a, a tremendous amount of cost necessarily associated with climate change. It's like a relatively modest amount of it. So I got done on the show, and I was pretty good. Uh, we go to the green room, and Joe says, uh, hey, have you read Hansen's testimony ever? <laughs> I said, well, a long time ago. I said, but uh, to be honest, I'm relying on testimony provided by a climate scientist uh, in front of the Senate a few months ago. And he says, well, do me a favor, heck boy. He says, you go back to your office if you really feel like, like it. I, mean, I can't make you, and I doubt you ever will. He said, but if you go back to your office, I dare you, reread that testimony. He says, now if you do reread that testimony, here's what, here's what you're going to find. Narrowly speaking, what you said was correct. But the reality is, James Hansen offered several different temperature scenarios. You just discussed one. He also offered scenario A, which he called business as usual, correct. B had a B and a C, with temperature projections associated with it. He says, if you look back, you'll find that scenario A was off because he just overestimated greenhouse gas emissions. We had a recession since that time. Uh, clean energy, you know, natural gas started penetrating the market. So if you want to say he was wrong about something, you can say he was wrong about the amount of emissions that uh, we were going to see in the future. And that's why the temperature projections were off. He goes, but if you look at his other scenarios, you'll find that one of those scenarios has emissions projections that pretty much track what we've seen. And then you'll see a temperature projection associated with that emissions projection. And if you bother going through all of this, you're going to find that his projection with regards to temperature was spot on, given the emissions we've seen. He said, no, notice, however, it took me about a, three minutes to unpack your nonsense. I don't have time to do that on, on TV. He says, but the reality is you're being terribly misleading. You're being terribly misleading. And I, don't, I, I, and I hate having to debate people. Well, that's active a challenge. So I went back to my office and did <laughs> the testimony. So I'm in the business of showing Joe Rahm that he's wrong. Turns out he was right. And I was a little shaken by this. And I went uh, to see the climate skeptic at issue, credentialed scientist and, you know, a fellow who had taught in universities and published in peer-reviewed literature. And he had argued the narrative that I had offered on TV. And I said, told him about what happened. And I said, uh, where am I wrong here? Because it seems to me that that Rahm has got a point. So what am I missing? Turns out I wasn't missing anything. This scientist was consciously and purposely misrepresenting the conversation. Now, he didn't do that because he's in the pay of the, you know, the oil and gas industry, though he was in the oil and gas industry. He really believed his narrative. But the point was he was cheating. All right? To make his case seem strong, he was misrepresenting the debate. And as you notice on Fox News, the story about how all the climate models run hot and they're all kind of fantasies and the data we have don't under, you know, do not support those conclusions, that's really wrong. But it's based on narratives like this. So after that particular event, I began to do the due diligence I should have been doing uh, as a climate advocate at the Cato Institute. And I found over and over and over again the scientific narratives and studies that were being offered by climate skeptics of the lot. They were either consciously and purposely misleading, or they were cherry-picking data, or they were just frankly bad. 
And there was a reason they weren't in the peer-reviewed literature. They were crap. And so I stopped talking about science for the most part. And I started talking about economics. Because even if you accept IPCC narratives back then, you could find, you could make a pretty reasonable case the cost of taking fossil fuels out of the economy is, is staggering. And that's more costly than the more modest scenarios for climate change, even given median estimates from the IPCC. So I was specializing in something I was a little bit more comfortable which was the economics. But then a paper came along by a friend of mine named John Adler. John is, uh, was a libertarian uh, climate uh, skeptic like me, working for another organization called the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which is a big climate denial operation. But he left, C he left CEI to go into law school. He now teaches at Case Western. And then he had a paper that came out around 2007 in which he said, even if the climate skeptics are right about everything they say, even if my old boss is a sea guy are right, even if Cato's right, even if Heritage is right, even if all the right-wingers are correct, that climate change would be a relatively non-policy, modest event. That's not an argument against climate action. He said, at least not if you're a libertarian. Because what that argument really amounts to is if party A is destroying the persons and properties of party B, but A gains more than B loses, all's good. This is when the libertarians, you know, find themselves in a world in which they, they believe the property rights were not worth protecting as long as destroying them really enriched somebody a heck of a lot. Well, that was something you would think that would have occurred to me by now, but I hadn't really thought about it that way. And I started talking to some of my colleagues at, on the right and saying, what did you think of Adler's new paper? And it turns out this is like talking to Catholics about they, what they thought about Martin Luther back in the day. This was just something that was not to be discussed. And that also rattled me because that was an important point. At that point, at that time, I was still a relatively radical, orthodox libertarian who thought that government's job is to protect the rights to property and the rights of people not to be destroyed or have their rights infringed upon. That's why we have government. And we don't just selectively protect people and property uh, as long as you know destroying that per that uh, that property somehow makes somebody a problem. Then Along came the revolution in economics. I, and up to that point, I could still find credentialed economists were relatively uh, lukewarm about climate action. But as time went on, as the evidence for climate change mounted, and as low carbon energy became more and more affordable, it got to the point, literally speaking, now I'm not exaggerating, literally, I could not find a credentialed economist in academia who published in the peer-reviewed literature on climate change who did not support some sort of car climate action and primarily carbon pricing as a response. Not one. None of the conservative, you know, free market economists that I've been used to preparing to were any longer arguing that point. Now this is really kind of dangerous. If you work for a free market think tank, my job is to marshal academic expertise for my position. And I couldn't find it. It just completely disappeared. Not true. If I worked hard, I could go find the chair in entrepreneurship at the, at, uh, you know, the Koch-funded, BB&T funded uh, economics department of Boise State College, where he doesn't write at all on climate change. He's just a right-winger who read you know, Mises, Hayek, and maybe Ayn Rand, and opines for a living. But those aren't the people I wanted. I wanted experts, and I couldn't find them. And then the final, so at this point, I pretty much stopped talking about climate change, unless I absolutely had to, uh, because I was no longer confident in any of these arguments. And then I met a guy named Bob Litterick. <clears throat> Bob came into my office uh, a few years ago. I, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you wouldn't know who he is, but Bob Lillian, uh is, was a partner at Goldman Sachs. Made a lot of money in that regard. He was one of the first quants on Wall Street. In fact, he'd set up the first quant operation on Wall Street. Within academia, however, he also still has a very good reputation. He's thought of as one of the top risk management professionals in the United States. And Bob came in to see me, and he says, look, now, he was something of a libertarian, so our doors would open. He said, look, the problem I have with this entire debate is twofold. One, he says, you guys at Cato were in a hot debate with climate activists about what the most likely outcome from climate change is. Your guys said it will be on the lower end of the scale of the likely you know, uh, scenarios, and environmental activists said it will be on the higher end, and they talk about all the extreme stuff. So this is the wrong debate to have. I don't care who's right or who's wrong in that, because it's not the right way to look at this. There is a large distribution of possible outcomes from climate change, some of which are relatively modest, some of which are planet threatening. And we don't really know for certain what the chances are of very much of any of those scenarios coming to play because of all the rampant uncertainty. This is an unprecedented experiment we're doing on the planet. We have never before loaded up greenhouse gases at this level. We can't go back in history to find out how the planet 
planet response. The best we can do is look at paleoclimate data, and it suggests pretty bad stuff. He said, but anyway, that's beside the point. He says, as a risk management professional at Goldman Sachs, I had to deal with climate risks like this all the time. He said, they weren't called climate risks. There were other financial risks. You know, when I have to invest our clients' money in things, we have the same problem. There's a large distribution of possible outcomes from my investment. I can't quantify exactly what the chances of any of these scenarios come into play, but that doesn't mean I ignore it and just say, what's the most likely scenario, and that's for the best. He said, because if that was the most likely scenario, there wouldn't be a Goldman Sachs. You just put all your money in equities, probably in a mutual fund, and be done with it, right? Because the most likely event in where you invest your money is stocks will return better than bonds, and they'll return pretty well, and you put them in a mutual fund so that uh, you're not betting on a handful of companies, and, and you walk away. But no, but some people do that, but other people don't. And he said, and if you said, we have to price the risk as best we can. And after we price those risks, maybe we hedge, maybe we don't. But if you price the risks associated with the distribution of possible outcomes from climate change, you're going to find that the case against action falls apart completely. Because at the far end of some of these scenarios, which are not the slightest bit impossible, uh, the planet is baked. The planet is absolutely baked. We don't have another planet to go on. He said, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that climate change is a non-diversifiable risk. And what that means in finance is there's nothing I can invest in that will pay off if climate change plays out in an extreme scenario. He says, now, this is important because in markets, that's often how we hedge, right? I mean, if I'm going to take a risk over here and that, you know, some bad scenarios come into play, I'm going to make countervailing investments that will pay off if those bad scenarios come into play and I'll be all good and made whole. But we can't do that with climate. How much do people pay to avoid non-diversifiable risks in financial markets? A stunningly large amount. We hate non-diversifiable risks. And we should also look at it that way when we're looking at both parts. I found that incredibly compelling. And I thought at that point there was nothing but radioactive trouble around everything that I've been doing for 23 years. So I left the Cato Institute for those and other reasons because there was no room for climate uh, uh, for mainstream climate arguments within the Cato Institute to start my own organization called the Niskanen Center. We deal with things beyond climate, but climate is a major aspect of our work. It's my background. I know quite a bit about it, and I'm in a unique position to talk about it with Republican audiences. So with the few minutes we have, let me talk about Republican audiences. The reason I want to talk about them is when I know something about them. Uh, second, uh, they're the important blocking agents to climate action in, in, in the United States politics. If it were not for Republican opposition, we would not be having these conversations. And so whenever we talk about uh, climate policy and climate politics, the first and most important thing to think about is how will what we're doing affect Republican opposition? Because if it's not going to affect Republican opposition, then you're wasting your time. Because the case for climate action has already been successfully made in the Democratic Party with people on the left and the center of American politics. It's on the right where we have our troubles. So, how do you talk to Republicans? How do you talk to conservative Republicans? Well, it's important to speak their language. Russian. <laughs> I joke. I joke. Their, uh, their handlers generally write and speak in English. So they don't need to train. But it's, it's important to speak their language. By that I mean messenger. Is almost always, messenger is almost always more important than message. And this is just a matter of human nature. It's nothing unique in the Republican brain. We tend to discount people who we think don't share our values and our ideas about life, uh, and we tend to trust people who do. This is why Fox News is such an exciting media experience for conservatives. They trust Sean Hannity and, and uh, people on that step network because they trust, they, they represent things that they believe. And they have values that they embrace. They trust them more. And so if you're talking to Republican audiences, it's important to keep in mind that the messenger has to be someone who can appeal or seem to appeal to these underlying values and uh, uh, worldviews of conservatives. Uh, now, so where does their opposition come from? Uh, in the film we just saw, uh, uh, Years of Living Dangerously in Other Places, on the left, we often hear, well, it's fossil fuel companies, they own the GOP, blah, 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 blah. Well, there, to some extent, that's correct. Uh, to some, I don't know, some fossil fuel companies, but a lot of them don't. ExxonMobil's in favor of a carbon price now after having been in a different place. So are a number of other vertically oil, uh, integrated oil and gas companies. 
It's not primarily about donations and political power from fossil fuel companies. I can tell you this because I used to be on the other side and I used to work with these people and I used to work with conservatives who shared my views. What's going on here is ideology. Now you would think this is silly. Why, why would your ideology color how you, re, how you read atmospheric physics? But the reality is people judge policy based on the implications of different arguments. And in the Republican conservative mind, if they agree that climate change is a significant risk that requires government action, the implication is government, which conservatives don't like, unless Donald Trump does. They don't like government. They don't like taxes. They don't like regulation. And when somebody says, we've got to rip all the fossil fuels out of the economy to deal with this, now they really want proof. In other words, you have a tremendous amount of motivated cognition to find stories that says, we don't have to turn this over. And besides that, they believe that people who want climate action or people in other contexts also hate capitalism. And this is an exaggeration. If you go to Naomi Klein's book, she argues climate change is the rationale for finally putting a stake through the heart of global capitalism, which has been her uh, bet noir for a long time now. So you, I don't have to invent those arguments. There are lots of people who don't like capitalism, don't like free markets, who consider climate change like a gift from heaven. They can finally go back and do something. But so you don't. It's important to, when talking to conservative audiences, to not imply that big government is a necessary uh, uh, requirement to address climate change. And as you know, and you've heard some comments, I'm sure, at this conference uh, before I came to the podium, that uh, conservatives are uniquely positioned to take a weapon out of their toolbox, which is perfectly positioned to solve this problem, which is to har har harness markets and price signals to do instead what we might otherwise ask regularly which is to price carbon and then leave the decision about where, when, and how to respond to that price to consumers and producers. Let them decide how much they want to hedge, how much they want to invest in this, that, or the other technology or energy efficiency. We're not going to tell them how to run their lives. We're not going to run a command and control system. We're simply going to let markets do this. And we know that markets are pretty efficient. This appeals to Republican sentiment. Uh, it's also important not to talk about civilizational transformation. Many of you might think civilization needs a transformation. Uh, there, is, there are lots of narratives on the environmental left about how we're too consumer-minded, we're too materialistic, uh, we need to get back in touch with uh, nature. Uh, even if you read Al Gore's Earth and the Balance, which I did in mind shamelessly for 15 years or so when I was on the other side of this argument, he talks about how we need to get rid of this whole obsession with economic growth and consumption and get in touch with our pre-pastoral lives before the Industrial Revolution where mankind was really happy. And i got to tell you, maybe that appeals some places, maybe on some college campuses, maybe in Austin, Texas, I guarantee you that this is pure poison in any Republican audience. Because they kind of like making stuff, and they like consuming things, and by the way, there's a really strong argument that human well-being has been radically improved by the Industrial Revolution and by manufacturing and all the things a lot of people on the left sometimes like to dislike. Um, so, not a good idea. Uh, so. If you're ever tempted to say we need, uh, we need a World War II style undertaking, as Bill McKibben would argue, uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> it's not going to work with Republicans. <laughs> Nor will it be, like, and sometimes I come to events like this and everything's vegetarian. Why? Because we know that meat consumption has a lot of CO2 associated with it, not very climate friendly, so a lot of environmentalists will like to have conferences like this with tofu and all kinds of you know, vegetables. So well, all well and good, eat what you like. You know, I'm a libertarian to some extent still, so you know, I'm not going to, you know, cash judge. I'm not going to be judgy about this. But if you're talking to conservatives and Republicans, you say, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, we got to get rid of the meat too. Now that's not going to go over. <laughs> so now it may you may wonder <clears throat> whether it's really worth your time to talk much to conservatives. They don't seem very movable. They seem pretty rooted in their positions. Uh, they can seem troubles. But as Yitzhak Rabin once said, uh, who was the former uh, prime minister in Israel, uh, the really hard thing about uh, negotiating peace is you have to do it with your enemies. And right now, the conservative right is your enemy on climate. There is no going forward without some degree of bipartisan support from the GOP and from the right. And if you think there is, you're living in a fantasy. Uh, in fact, political science literature is chock full of study after study after study showing that Virtually nothing ever passes in American government without some degree of bipartisan support. Every once in a blue moon, something might, like the Affordable Care Act, and it is always on Bob the Brown <laughs> after, and only because of Republican incompetence right now has it survived. 
So my point is, if we are really going to go down a path of decarbonizing this economy and transforming uh, the United States and addressing climate risk, you're not going to do it with the perpetual opposition of a major political party. You can't. It is too big an undertaking. So our challenge is to find ways to decarbonize that are market friendly, that appeal to Republican sentiments, and that can resonate with that. So how might you do that? Look, there is absolutely nothing conservative about playing dice with the planet and the fate of this plan. There is nothing at all conservative about that. Most Republicans and conservatives I know understand that at core. But they think it's more undangerous to unleash government and put it in the hands of people who want to destroy free market capitalism. And that's why they fight. So our job is to show them that's not necessary. Anyway, I'm sorry I've used all but about six minutes of my time, so I'll stop there and open it up for your questions and comments. But thank you for, uh, for your patience. Questions, you raise your hand, and unless I think you're about to open weaponry on me, I'll call. <laughs> so I've always been, um, I don't understand how a carbon tax or a, a price on carbon and no government intervention works, right? Because if you're going to price carbon, there needs to be government intervention for that to happen. So how do you appeal to that and also the less government side? Well, you're right. I mean, to tax is to use the power of government. Absolutely. But Mr. Milton Friedman argued you've got a pollution issue. The best and most efficient way to deal with it is just put a price on the pollution and then let markets respond accordingly. So that's per per perfectly within the wheelhouse of conservative and libertarian thought. The underlying point here is that you can't skate by climate and a lot of times environmentalists try to do that. They know talk about climate change and Republicans are really tough, it's a big heavy lift. They say, well, let's just talk about clean energy and air pollution and jobs you're going to get from clean energy. Don't ever talk climate change with right wingers because it's just going to be those are fighting wars. You can't do it. It has to be addressed. Because we do talk about clean energy and clean air and clean water. And how's that coming as far as decarbonization is concerned? It's not going to get the job done. So the important point that I find when you talk to conservatives and libertarians is say, look, government is here. There's only one reason that you people think we have, should have government. Protect property rights from people who would destroy it. Well, it turns out putting greenhouse gas in the atmosphere threatens the property rights of everybody in the most profound manner you can possibly imagine. And if you're going to countenance that violence on property rights, give me your libertarian card right now. Because you, you're surrendering. You don't care. Simply because the guy who makes a lot of profit, if this is named Charles Koch, or maybe he works at ExxonMobil, or maybe he's a coal miner who indirectly gets a job shooting up the planet and putting us all at risk. Now it turns out, believe it or not, most people on the right do have principles. They're not purely satanically <laughs> They may disagree with what you believe, but they really firmly believe that government should be here to protect our rights to, to, to property and to protect us from violence. And if you can talk about climate change in that context, your reporter is the way up. Something that's worked really well for me, winning over uh, people that would normally be at my throat with this issue, is showing that we're really fighting elite powers by doing this, that our EPA is much smaller than the subsidies that we give to these big companies because of this revolving door. So we're actually protecting the free market by fighting big oil. Uh, I personally am not... I'm no fan of the free market, <laughs> honestly. I think we need more government regulation, but that I think that is something that works really well, just showing that you're fighting government by doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, how do you talk about, you kind of mentioned already, like the emphasis on clean energy jobs, 